Um, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to the final program for this academic year in our US-Japan short take series. Uh, our topic today is revising Japan's security policy for a rapidly changing world. And our speaker is a renowned expert on Japanese national security policy, uh, Yuki Tatsumi, who is a senior fellow and director of the Japan program at the Stimson Center. Uh, I'm Bruce Aronson, a resident uh, affiliated scholar at the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law, and I'll act as the host today. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to make a very brief announcement concerning next week's program. Uh, it's entitled, How Overloaded Chinese Courts Handle Takings Claims. It will be next Wednesday, April 20th from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And Shitong Chao of Duke University School of Law and Chao Chun Zhang of Lingnan College at Sun Yat-sen University uh, will introduce their findings about how an increase in Chinese courts workloads uh, seems to have affected the outcome in property takings cases. Uh, before we hear from our speaker, I would first like to thank our co-sponsor for today's event, uh, the Consulate General of Japan in New York, and invite their representative, uh, Director Kenju Murakami, uh, to make some opening remarks. Uh, Murakami, how welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm uh, Kenju Murakami, Director of Japan Information Center of the Consulate of Japan. Um, as a co-organizer of this event, uh, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank uh, uh, Usali uh, for arranging this uh, uh, very timely webinar. As a former student of Professor Alvarez uh, uh, at the University of Michigan some 25 years ago, I'm under constant pressure to do something meaning meaningful uh, to Usali, especially when it comes to Japan. So today uh, I feel a little bit relieved because I can do a little bit of uh, the obligation uh, to um, uh, Professor Alvarez. Um, today I'm so excited because uh, uh, today's speaker, uh, Yuki Tatsumi, is probably the most qualified speaker uh, on the recent security landscape of East Asia and the response of the uh, Japan US Alliance. The last time I saw, uh, was right before the COVID, November 2019 in Pittsburgh. She was a guest speaker at the annual um, dinner of Japan US Society of Pennsylvania, while uh, where I was attending as the representative of the uh, consulate. The audience, mainly the business people in manufacturing sectors uh, in Pittsburgh, were not familiar with uh, uh, geopolitics but they were all literally mesmerized by Tatsumi's uh, articulate and yet easy to understand lecture on the security situation of North Asia, Northeast Asia. This webinar cannot be more timely as the world witnesses the blatant infringement upon sovereignty and international law uh, in Ukraine. Foreign Minister Hayashi of Japan said to the Wall Street Journal uh, interview before the inv invasion of Russia that if something happens on the Ukraine border, that outcome might affect other people's calculations in Asia. This is kind of the background of Japan's very swift and determined sanction measures against Russia and strong support to Ukraine. Turning to Japan-US relations, Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden talked online about 80 minutes in January. The topics of this summit meeting between um, the two leaders were all related to one uh, security issues. They talked about the strengthening of Japan-US alliance, free and open in the Pacific and the uh, Quad summit, situation of China, North Korea and Ukraine. Even economic issues were underpinned by security concerns like supply chain resilience. And the two leaders agreed on the establishment of the economic two plus two ministerial meeting. Japan's national security strategy is going to be revised this year against the background of these developments. 
close and seamless exchange of views on all levels, those between uniformed personnel, foreign and defense officers, and political leaders are all more important than ever. Equally important is the understanding of the peoples of the two democratic allies. I'm sure today's talk by Yuki Tatsumi will help you understand the common challenges of US and Japan and how the Alliance is coping with these unprecedented challenges in this uncharted water. Thank you very much. And very much looking forward to um, today's lecture and discussion. Well, thank you very much for your uh, insightful comments. Um, so we've already had a brief introduction, but uh, Yuki Tatsumi is, as I mentioned, a senior fellow, co-director of the East Asia program and director of the Japan program at the Stimson Center. Uh, before joining Stimson, uh, she worked as a research associate at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and also as a special assistant for political affairs at the Embassy of Japan in Washington. Um, she's received numerous awards, which I will not go into, and has written very broadly on Japan's national security policy and foreign policy. Uh, her bio uh, briefly is on our website and in more detail is on the website of the Stimson Center. Uh, we are very pleased uh, to welcome Yuki to join us today. Um, when we first approached uh, Yuki to share her views with us on national security policy, um, that was before the invasion of Ukraine. At that time, we knew that Japan's national security policy was up for fundamental review for the first time in 10 years. Um, and obviously the Ukraine situation uh, has made this a far more pressing topic and has also opened up, I think, new lines of debate and argument in Japan in areas that were previously quite sensitive where discussion was limited or in some cases even virtually non-existent. Um, so it is very timely uh, to hear from Yuki on how recent events are likely to influence Japan's national security review and the likely direction Japan's revised security policy might take. Our program today is 60 minutes. Uh, we will first hear a short presentation from the speaker, uh, followed by a conversation uh, between us, uh, and then we will go to the Q&A uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, as a reminder, um, please use the Q&A icon to send us questions. Uh, the chat function will not be operating uh, for the audience. Uh, let's begin. Uh, Yuki, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Virus, and thank you, Murakami-san, for a very kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining joining this event, um, joining your lunch hour. As uh, both uh, Bruce and uh, Murakami-san alluded to, this year is a really big year for Japan's national security strategy, and the reason reason also has been articulated by um, two who the uh, two who have uh, spent the, uh, a little bit time kindly introducing me. Japan is revising its uh, national security strategy for the first time since it was adopted back in December 2013 under Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Abe. And for those of us who also watches Japanese defense policy quite closely, tandem with the revision of national security strategy, two guiding, uh, guiding pol policy guidance documents, uh, national defense program guidelines and midterm defense program, which is the acquisition midterm acquisition planning document are both uh, um, also under the revision and to be concluded. So roughly the schedule um, national security strategy uh, review is already underway. And it is expected to be concluded by sometime, uh, sometime by the end of uh, December this year, but usually it comes out probably in the first or second week of December. And other two documents, National Defense Program Guidelines and Midterm Defense Program, both of them are also anticipated to come out roughly around the same time, um, most likely shortly follows the uh, National Security Strategy. So the key question of uh, revising national security strategy this time is really comes down to this uh, one fundamental issue, which is how much will or can Japan relieve itself from normative constraints that have informed and constrained the implementation of its security policy since the end of the Cold War, um, since the end of the Cold World War II. 
it is really interesting because a lot of times when you when you when you read um, English based literature about Japanese security policy defense policy, many of them have um, attributed uh, Japan's constraints back to the uh, Constitution. And actually, that is not exactly the truth. It's only the half truth. It is rather, um, it is true that the Article 9 and the uh, spirit that, that is embodied in that article really does lay the foundation for the basic uh, position that Japan's uh, security policy has been oriented since 1945. However, real constraint really comes from the uh, normative constraints anchored in the uh, memory of World War II, which is, uh, of course, amplified by Article 9. And the one single um, big constraint that has uh, con that has um, informed uh, Japanese national security policy is no use of force to resolve armed conflict or international differences. And that ends up, uh, that actually resulted in several policy decisions that Japan has made several decades ago. And that, that includes, but not only, limit, not only limited to, very restrained role of the Japan self-defense forces to be um, limited to exclusively defense-oriented posture and uh, its, uh, its operations. No use of outer space for security, uh, national security purposes. It only was supposed to be used just for um, civilian engineering, um, education, and scientific exploration. No, Japan is not to export no, no arms or weapon-related technologies. So those are just a few examples of the constraints that uh, that normative constraints uh, that has uh, informed by the Constitution. And these constraints have really um, constrained uh, Japan from trying to exp expand its international role, especially after the end of the Cold War, um, end of the Cold War. I think for those of us uh, who are old enough to remember, I certainly am. Um, at when the uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait in early 1990s and the first Gulf War happened, Japan's uh, rather tardy response, um, and uh, which is predominantly financial, and the only only a human um, human response was to dispatch its minesweepers way after the conflict ended, was roundly criticized by the international community as their human. Uh, contribution to the operation or international effort is too little too late. And Japan pr pr uh, primarily resorted to checkbook diplomacy and not uh, walking, uh, not step, uh, keeping in step with the uh, rest of the uh, international, international com community in its, its response to the uh, invasion of Kuwait. And this uh, constraints, uh, this really prompted Japan to first start uh, looking for a place to expand its role um, in international security and first peacekeeping operations. But even that uh, debate over how much of that is allowed, what has been, was constrained uh, strictly by these uh, normative, um, normative constraints that I have um, outlined in the beginning. And this constraint pretty much has uh, continued to exist throughout the first 20 years of the uh, after the post Cold War era, despite the uh, nuclear threat from North Korea became more becoming more imminent. The world see the war against ter um, international terrorism by Al Qaeda, and as uh, even if uh, China begins to slowly emerge as the uh, powerful economic um, international economic powerhouse and certainly began to display a little bit of an assertive behavior and the other parts of its policies. But since 19, uh, 2010 or so, Japan has been grappling with the reality that the security environment that surrounds them may no longer allow them or actually afford them to uh, continue to uh, strictly uphold these norms of constraints that some to some extent, either re relaxing some of those constraints or relief, uh, relieving Japan from some of these constraints is not just necessary for its own poli uh, uh, for policy making, but then also it is uh, it is critical for its own national security national security and uh, national defense. There are a couple of drivers that are behind this thinking, and first is the. Um, First is the emergence of China. 
Japan still continued to welcome China's um, China's uh, emergence as the uh, as a great um, great economy. At the same time, though, in recent years, and especially after 20, uh, 2010, it it uh, begins to uh, cons get concerned more and more about its uh, behavior that it's showing in the East China Sea and South China Sea, and how uh, it it um, use, utilizes all elements of national power, including the measures such as uh, development assistance and economic assistance to other countries, to um, to sometimes uh, sometimes uh, put pressure on those countries to align their position with that, those of China's in some of those international issues. And secondly, um, this was this actually has begun a little bit uh, during the uh, toward the uh, end of the Obama administration. But particularly during the four years of the Trump administration, there has been a growing question within Japan that the uh, kind of a transactional approach that uh, came out of Washington under pres former President Trump and uh, U.S. Uh, withdrawal, uh, by and large, from those international agreements such as Paris, uh, Paris, uh, Paris Accord on uh, climate change and uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, is this just anomaly for this particular president or is this an underlying current that could always uh, resurface depending on who the presidents might be? So there is a growing question about the uh, reliability of the US, um, United States as Japan's alliance partner. And in by when I say that though, to clarify, um, Japan has no question about the uh, commitment and the ties between two militaries that uh, it has enjoyed uh, for the last seven years. It, there are, however, questioning the uh, U.S. direction more at the uh, policymaking level and the more political level. So if you look at the uh, Japan's uh, response to the uh, current ongoing Ukraine cri Ukrainian crisis, one can, one can definitely say that this is one of the manifestation of these uh, questions that Japan has been uh, grappling with and how Japan, how Japan comes out of this uh, self-questioning. As we all know, um, Japan comes out quite, quite strong and firm, um, standing against the, uh, Russia and uh, keeping locksteps lock with the uh, US and the other its, uh, Western partners. And uh, for example, it has been uh, closely aligned itself on the sanction implementation. Uh, it also has been, it also has decided to provide bulletproof jacket and other equipment to Ukraine. And it also is uh, under on, on the uh, cups of deciding the uh, self-defense forces that transport aircraft that dispatch to the uh, to the uh, countries around the Ukraine to uh, support the uh, humanitarian refugee missions. And it also has begun to accept Ukrainian refugees to uh, to its own country. So as you can see, J Japan has taken all these measures at the cost of uh, peace treaty negotiations with uh, Russia. And uh, as you can imagine, Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin already has come out and say that the, it will suspend its peace talk with uh, peace talk with Japan. But long before he said that, um, Prime Minister Kishida, in response to uh, questions by media, clearly said that the, in the face of Russian aggression and the clear violation of international law. Uh, Japan's relationship with Russia cannot be as business as usual anymore. And this is quite a firm statement coming out of the prime minister whose personality is known to be very uh, more on the soft side and, and a very soft spoken leader. So this, uh, given all this uh, development, um, how, how all these uh, would continue to inform uh, Japan's uh, revision process of national security policy? I think one you can um, you can probably see in the uh, revised national national security strategy that the Japan would really anchor the uh, protection or defense defense of universal universal norms and uh, directly correlate that with its own national security. 
it has already, and while, while the re revision is ongoing, it has already also begun to take steps to prepare itself um, for potential uh, econ economic and trade decoupling that could come down at the end, at, as a result of this conflict. As uh, both uh, Bruce and Murakami-san mentioned, a Jap Japanese diet is currently deliberating economic, secu uh, economic security law. And that is, uh, that is expected to address some of these uh, challenges that, that might occur when Japan needs to really begin to uh, decouple its economy away from China, away from Russia in serious ways. And it also is, uh, there is also a lot more debate going on on Japan's defense, defense posture. And that, that began to include the topic that, as, a, uh, as a Bruce alluded to, some of them were considered strict taboo um, in the uh, Japanese discourse. And biggest, uh, two biggest uh, issues on this. One is the uh, Japan's uh, preempt preemptive uh, strike capability, whether Japan should have, sh should have it at all. And if, if it does, what kind of capability should Japan pursue? And the second, a more recent one in response to Ukraine situa Ukrainian situation is whether Japan should seriously begin to consider a nuclear sharing arrangement with the United States. Um, both of these, especially the uh, debate on the uh, nuclear sharing is still very, very at the nascent, nascent stage. So I actually cannot predict how it's going to shake out. But um, if you think about um, Japan's uh, Japan's past as the only country that has faced the uh, actual impact of their nuclear nuclear arsenal, the fact that the country is debating this itself is the um, itself is is uh, quite um, revolutionary. And similar thing can be said about the ongoing debate on uh, Japan's uh, preemptive strike capability. When when Japan has been strictly um, equipping defense equipment that are called defense, and that actually has result, resulted in the past some of the a little bit inefficient um, acquisition when it comes to a, its uh, defense equipment. The fact that uh, it even talks about strike capability itself um, is uh, noteworthy. So, like I said, I'm happy to uh, think with you, Bruce, um, as this uh, session goes on. But um, there are a lot of a uh, lot of a uh, lot of uh, things to consider moving moving forward uh, between now and the end of December. So, why don't I stop here, and then I start getting your questions and uh, start getting the audience's question. Well, Yuki, thank you very much for that very succinct overview uh, of today's topic, and you know, I, I think uh, I would like to follow up on a few of the things you mentioned. Um, one is the kind of evolution uh, away from these very restricted, restrictive norms that you uh, discussed or mentioned. Um, as I recall, as recently as 2015, when there was a law passed on collective self-defense, um, there was still, I'm sorry, I, don't, I didn't mean to uh, be in the dark here. Uh, at that point in time, there was still uh, a fair amount of public opposition, as I recall. Maybe polls showed a majority of people not in favor of the law. Um, uh, but very recently after Ukraine, we have Prime Minister Kishida, who I think was considered relatively dovish among the conservative establishment party, and who also, as we know, hails from Hir Hiroshima. And uh, that's people from there generally uh, don't like nuclear weapons. Um, he seems to be on board uh, at least generally, for a much more aggressive national security policy. So if in even, even the last four or five years, has this evolution away from the uh, constraint type norms uh, proceeded more rapidly, particularly in light of the Ukraine situation? Thank you, Bruce. You're absolutely right. Um, I still remember the uh, mass uh, dem public demonstration that surrounded really the Diet Building when the uh, Japanese government, um, back then it was under Prime Minister Abe's purview, um, passed the uh, peace and security legislation, which basically cre um, specifically legalizes the uh, limited reinterpretation of the Article 9 when it comes to a collective self-defense. I think I think, like you said, though, um, I think you really put the uh, nail on the head that uh, last, even the last four to five years, um, situation have uh, have changed 
quite a bit. China was not as aggressive four or five years ago. Russia uh, was certainly not, um, in, uh, not waged this full on scale warfare against Ukraine. If you recall, um, it did, uh, it did uh, we had seen the annexation of Crimea back in 2014. But then if you remember with the prime minister Abe in power, and as you mentioned, you know, co compared to um, prime minister Kishida, prime minister Abe has been known uh, to be this visionary leader who really supported a uh, strong Japanese defense and uh, a strong supporter of the uh, US Japan Alliance. But at that time, he didn't quite uh, take measure uh, so closely aligned with what US and the Europe was trying were trying to do back then because he would he was actually afraid that that would come at the cost of uh, ruining chance for Japan's uh, peace treaty negotiation negotiation with Russia. This time, of course, there was a similar concern, but the uh, given the current situation and then also Japanese leaders this time around is very keenly aware that China is watching how international community reacts to this Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, international community response in general, but more particularly how the US respond, uh, US respond uh, would be like would look like and then also US allies allies in Europe's response is going to be look like so Japan is very much aware of that so how it also responds to this situation will affect um, Chinese calculus right, so sir. so in my mind in my mind um, um, for China though I think um, what China saw in the aftermath, of uh, initial stage of the Russian invasion, especially the first couple of weeks, and it still continues to this day, but really the first couple of weeks sh should have caught them by surprise. It really saw the world led by US and European partners rapidly decoupled its financial system, its, you know, its trade. Sanction has been targeted at privileged class in Europe, I mean, in Russia. The Russian bank has been quick kicked out of a SWIFT system. Um, those things are also um, something that worries Chinese leaders very much. So yes, Japan's response definitely is um, in in back of Prime um, Prime Minister Kishida's mind. Um, there's no question in my mind that he and uh, his advisors, you know, Foreign Minister Hayashi, Defense Minister Kishi, all those people, they are thinking of what how the how our moves will be perceived by China. Okay, that was something I was going to ask. I think you already answered it. Uh, much of Japan's response to the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine um, was perhaps driven by trying to send a message to China. And certainly I would, I would assume that the central bank of Russia was surprised to find that half of their current foreign currency reserves were suddenly not available to them after they had built up uh, reserves for the purpose of uh, resisting or succeeding despite economic sanctions. Um, so would you, would you take the view then that in Japan, uh, people think they have successfully sent a strong message to China? Um, I think uh, they, I think if you're, if you talk to uh, people in the national security realm, um, economic security realm, I think um, they view their efforts to be still, um, still effort, effort, um, ongoing effort, but they are hopeful, I think, that uh, not just Japan's action, but then also US's reaction and European countries' reaction have sent the collective message, collectively sent a message to China that don't get too overconfident about how your economy is so intertwined with ours because there are measures that could cut that. Right. Um, so maybe we should move on more to, uh, you, you mentioned um, Western uh, countries allied uh, with respect to sanctions against Russia. And you, you mentioned in your initial remarks some concern about whether politically the US was a re reliable partner uh, following the recent example in the Trump administration. Um, how about collective defense? We hear a lot about um, the quadrilateral security dialogue, the quad, 
Uh, President Biden's coming to Japan was in May to, and his second day there will coincide with a meeting of the Quad. Mm -hmm. um, Japan uh, concluded a new defense agreement with Australia this past January. Um, so there seems to be a lot of activity uh, related toward collective security and particularly the Quad. And how is collective defense and the Quad viewed from Japan these days? So I think a collective defense um, is uh, in, in Japanese discourse, I think collective defense and collective self-defense are often get confused. And in terms of collective defense, collective self-defense, as you know, this is very politically sensitive issues. And I think debate on this is are still very intense, even after the limited reinterpretation of that particular right. Collective defense, though, I think is has been considered as a more of a loosely formed term in terms of how much uh, Japan should do call, you know, coalition wise and participating in international coalition. And then also how much Japan can should do Japan can and should do with the uh, uh, US um, allies and partners in the uh, Indo-Pacific region and beyond. And then I think, as you can see, um, Japan's response to uh, initial response to their uncertainty about um, U.S. Uh, political future and its a uh, future political levels commitment um, toward alliance alliances and partnership. I think it kind of manifests itself in two ways. Um, Prime Minister Abe really spearheaded that, that both of those uh, reactions. One is to really doubling down on the uh, alliance cooperation with the United States at the uh, more of a professional level. But then the, on the other hand, um, it really did begin to invest in some serious ways about expanding its relationship with uh, other US uh, ally, um, alliance partners, such as Australia. And uh, I think uh, back in uh, when Prime Minister was, um, Abe was in power, I think um, he went, um, he was the first uh, Japanese Prime Minister who attended and actually delivered the keynote at I think uh, North Atlantic Council. So he he really began to uh, invest his relationship in Japan's relationship in Japan's relationship with uh, Europe, you know, NATO, both NATO and EU. And I think Prime Minister Kishida really much uh, pick up that torch and basically running with it. And same thing with Quad. Um, as you as we all remember, um, Prime Minister Abe really is the, actually the first one that came up with the concept of free and open Indo-Pacific, and which uh, President Trump very com conveniently kind of took it and then put his own name on it, but. Um, um, Prime Minister Abe's supporter um, still does con um, does I believe that that is originally Prime Minister Abe, so he should have copyrighted that one. <laughs> you like, but um, but um, that's the uh, that that was another area where um, Prime Minister Abe first uh, initially launched the first round of e effort on Quad, and then his successor, both uh, Prime Minister Suga. Um, in his uh, brief term, he really accelerated that corporate cooperation on the, uh, especially on the more of a um, scientific technology cooperation and vaccine development and distribution. But then now with Prime Minister Kishida and with the current uh, Ukrainian situation, I think he's really um, po um, positioning Japan to um, press uh, Quad to expand its uh, more of a, it's a cooperation and collaboration on the security realm. One worry that I think Japanese leaders have, and I think uh, this, uh, this concern has been shared by actually US and Australia, is how India has been quite wishy-washy when, when it comes to Russia. And some of India's response is kind of understandable. A um, lot of its uh, defense equipment is coming from, it does come from Russia. So um, India doesn't have a luxury of uh, isolating itself from uh, Russia completely. But that said, I think um, its reaction, even with the, uh, even in the face of such a vast uh, human rights violation, international you know, law violation, um, very possible, very possible um, charges for war criminal post uh, conflict, um, how India still has not been openly criticizing Russian behavior, I'm sure is very concerning for US, Australia, and Japan. So I wonder, one of the one of the things that I'm curious about is when four leaders meet in Japan next month for the Quad Summit, whether those are three, so President Biden, Prime Minister Kishida, and uh, Prime Minister Morrison, they, they try to push India to come out a little bit cleaner or closer 
to their side as opposed to maintaining its current position. Okay, so while we're talking about collective defense and the Quad, uh, we should also note recent developments in South Korea. You now have a new conservative president there um, who is a noted China hawk in sharp contrast to his predecessor. So can we expect uh, more cooperation between South Korea and Japan um, who have been having trouble cooperating in recent years, I think, to the frustration of the US? Is Korea a reliable partner like the US? It changes administrations with quite different policies on a regular basis. Um, but what, what do you see looking uh, forward for South Korea? Can the Quad become the Quint? I think that um, um, those in uh, Japan are cautiously optimistic about the new president. But for the uh, conservative president to be um, critical of Japan, they already have a precedence in pa um, president, former President Park Geun-hye. All the attributes should have made her more open to uh, cooperate with Japan on host of more current issues. But then at least for the first uh, 24 months of his, um, her presidency, she came out completely opposite of it. So, I but then at the same time, I think that a lot of the uh, advisors around the new uh, South Korean president um, is uh, known figures for Japanese officials, uh, they have worked with many of them over the years uh, from either from Ministry of National Defense or our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So that gives them some sense of uh, comfort that at least uh, they have a little bit cleaner slate to start, um, almost like resetting their relationship with Seoul. But I think any South Korean president, the concern always arouses toward the end of the tenure. Like President, uh, former President Lee Moon Bak, who started off quite well with Japan. You know, he was one of the very first foreign leaders in the aftermath of uh, Japan's triple disaster back in 2011. Um, he, he, con he consistently talked about um, future oriented relationship with Japan, um, really pursued, uh, you know, closer security cooperation with Japan and so forth. But toward the end of the term, as his poll number lags, and this, uh, this uh, potential of uh, him um, being a uh, being charged with the corruption and other charges um, at, once he steps down, what does he do? He lands on the island that the that the Japan and South Korea disagrees on his sovereignty. So Japan is uh, cautiously optimistic, um, but at least uh, I think uh, Japan feels a little bit better about the resetting its relationship with Korea um, under the uh, new president, at least for you know at least for a little bit. So hopefully that stabilizes a little bit because really truly with uh, North Korea um, uptaking its uh, missile activities again, and especially the last uh, missile test that they conducted, which was clearly new types of ICBMs, should be concerning to Japan, but then also should be um, concerning to Korea as a, as a, another um, key uh, U.S. alliance partner in the region. Right. So another relationship to follow. Um, I'd like to turn a little bit to uh, economic security issues, which you touched upon. Um, so I'm still having a little bit of trouble uh, if China is the main threat and much of the new national security policy will be uh, geared toward dealing with that. And then at the same time, uh, China is Japan's largest trading partner. Now, uh, Mr. Abe recently made a statement that if China attacks Taiwan, it would be committing economic suicide. Um, would that be double suicide? Um, it's, uh, it's not, I, I, I think many of us have difficulty in sorting out the, the national security uh, aspect of economic relations versus the ongoing very deep economic uh, trade and investment relations with China. Do you have any further thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so I think this is this is really complicated. I mean, it's complicated here between US and China as uh, our strategic competition intensifies. But then it still is the case that the uh, um, you know, mutual trade still are substantial between US and China. So it so picture is very similar in Japan. But then at the same time, uh, in this uh, economic security bill, um, they do uh, tackle with some of the uh, long outstanding issue. Um, Japan has never um, had the entities that oversees foreign investments in Japan. So there has been a recent, um, this has been ongoing situation for the, at least for the last decade or so, that uh, um, 
the that land that are closer to like you know water resources or you know critical national infrastructure has been has become the subject of a foreign direct investment um certainly by china but probably also by other countries and which you know that kind of a deal that would have raised question here with the uh, entities like CFIUS. Um, Japan didn't have the screening process. So how to organize uh, something like that is uh, one of the main focus of this bill. And another thing is, um, although even though um, China is uh, Japan's uh, large, largest uh, trading partner, um, United um, Japan is finding increasingly more and more difficult co cooperate on the on the uh, area of advanced technologies and emerging technologies with the United States without um, sufficient uh, safeguard on its uh, on its uh, you know business intelligence and te technology intelligence and information on its uh, scientific um, scientific um, advancement. So some of those uh, what kind of restrictions that are, I guess, appropriately limits access to the individual, not just targeting China, but other um, countries that Japan has security concerns with, while still allowing, you know, basic, you know, academic freedom and uh, purely commercial transactions, how would, you know, while, how they can do that, you know, do both at the same time. I think one of the issues that uh, lawmakers are grappling with as they uh, as they um, consider this bill in the diet. Well, I think as you point out, this has been an issue uh, sort of on the back burner for several years. And even before the new legislation is enacted, for example, another issue in the news these days is what will happen to Toshiba Corporation as its activist shareholders are encouraging it to sell itself to a private equity firm. And I think it's a fairly much a consensus that there's now news reports that Bain Capital might make an offer, but extreme doubts that it would be able to acquire a company like Toshiba, which has nuclear and other defense technology, mm -hmm. without engaging with a Japanese partner who would play an important role, uh, mm -hmm. even in the absence of a formal CFIUS process. Mm -hmm. So I, I certainly um, would think that the last few years have set the stage for the enactment of the kind of uh, economic security law that's now pending in the diet. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it is overdue. And then I think the, um, I think they are intensifying the uh, competition with the uh, U.S. and China, and U.S. really having a greater scrutiny on those like either investments, um, corporate, you know, corporations, even on the civilian sector. Um, I think is uh, prompting um, Japan to uh, move a little bit faster than it, it used to. Okay, so let's move on. I think to the final topic before we go to the audience for questions, and that's bolstering Japan's own defense capabilities. And let's talk about the defense budget. So I know there's been a long-standing kind of informal constraint that the defense budget should not exceed, at least by very much, 1% uh, of GDP. Uh, and the current budget is about at that level, just above 1% of just GDP. Just above. Yeah, hover just above. Um, with, the, with the yen getting weak, the dollar value of the defense budget changes up every time I look at it. But I guess uh, the current defense budget is something like 44 billion US. That sounds about right. <laughs> maybe sixth in the world. Um, and it's still news in Japan that it exceeded 1% of GDP. On the other hand, you have a country like Germany, which has all now pledged to go from 1.5% of GDP to 2% to meet the NATO uh, standard or guidelines. And you have some people, conservatives in Japan, saying Japan should do that too. That seems to me like a huge break from what has existed in the past and also given Japan's large economy, that would uh, amount to a very significant uh, investment in defense capabilities. Um, what, do, what do we take from all that? Is the German example really putting more pressure on Japan? Is Japan really to take, ready to take a step that big? I think um, Germany's, um, Germany's decision certainly um, put people on alert because they, you know, G Germany has a similar history with Japan, obviously, you know, it has Nazi, Nazi history. It has a kind of a, you know, self-constrained uh, security role within NATO. And then now they're talking about 2% of defense. Um, 
so it def definitely has put people on, a, you know, some people on alert. However, and then also Prime Minister Kishida, quite frankly, I think they had, um, he had spoken about uh, Japan's defense budget eventually, you know, over time, uh, should, should shoot for 2% of uh, GDP. But then he didn't quite give it a, you know, kind of a schedule of how to, you know, how long it's going to take Japan to get there. So when he first said that, people were kind of thinking about it on the long term. But given the what the Ukrainian situation did was to those, um, especially those who watches um, this, the uh, Japan's uh, defense policy closely, um, it really it gave them a renewed sense of urgency that uh, Japan really has to um, bolster its own defense capability. If there's any one lesson that uh, people take away from a uh, Ukrainian situation is that if you demonstrate, if you don't, if you don't demonstrate your willingness to go at the bat and fight, fight for your own national defense, international community will not come here around, come rally around you. That is one big lesson that, I mean, it should be obvious, but that is one big lesson that, uh, that, the, that, that, is, that becomes like a big, big takeaway. So when Japanese, uh, those of us, who, those, of, those of them who are Japanese do, do uh, defense planning for Japan, when they look at Japan's uh, current capability from that light, there are certainly holes. And I think the question is how to fill the hole. And uh, as I mentioned, um, sometimes it's uh, this uh, peaceful um, normative constraint has uh, result resulted in Japan to actually pursue quite inefficient defense acquisition plan practice, force defense capability. So, you know, let this like one of the time old example is when Japan acquire a fighter, um, advanced fighter aircraft, it comes with a certain function that allows preemptive capability, but Japan actually dislodges that to make it, you know, exclusively defense oriented. So basically, you know, so be remodeling an aircraft in that way, you can imagine, takes quite a bit of money. And that, those are the type of money that Japan maybe didn't need to spend if their defense policy is not was not constrained with this norm, you know, norms. So I think the big question is how much of those norms can go away, or is Japanese leaders are willing to take it away? And it's still kind of too early to tell. Um, after all said and done, I can see um, limited movement um, towards a Japan taking a capability. Um, step toward acquiring those capabilities, but can they move with the sense of urgency that seems to be felt right now in those establishments? I'm not quite sure. Oh, good. Well, let's move on to some questions for the audience, and you just answered one of them. Okay. Was the, the question being how much support, public support is there for offensive strike capability? Um, another question regarded Russia. Uh, recently, there were military drills on the disputed islands just north of Hokkaido. Um, so, okay, we understand that Japan views China as the big threat. How about Russia as a national security threat? Is that new, increasing, worthy of greater consideration? What do you think? So Russia, or formerly Soviet Union, has been number one uh, security threat for Japan during the Cold War. And... Uh, Japan's defense posture was solely focused on potential invasion by Soviet military on the Hokkaido Island. But after the Cold War, that went away. However, though, um, Russia remains a constant threat, if you will. So if there is, there are a couple of a constant, so Russia is definitely a constant threat that the Japan has been facing. Um, Japanese uh, um, air defense force still scrambles against Russian air incursion. And what worries uh, defense policymakers more and more nowadays is that Russian um, act behavior around the Japanese archipelago, um, whether that may be air incursion or other activities, incur attempt to incursion or surveillance, surveillance flight around the islands, and those of China's seem to be increasingly more coordinated. And that 
definitely has been getting um, Japan's attention. And that, um, in, as a result, um, prop uh, Russia's uh, threat and Russia's picking order as a threat on upwards. Right. Thank you. Um, we have a, a, quite a number of lawyers in the audience, so they don't want to give up on Article 9. Um, okay. So let's start a little <laughs> bit. Um, so one of, when, when Mr. Abe was prime minister, one of his strongly announced goals was revision of Article 9. And that never happened. It was never, there were lots of internal discussions within the ruling conservative party, but never any formal proposal uh, sent to the diet. So um, is the more aggressive national security stance that we're discussing, um, do, do we need to think about the constitution at all or simply through interpretation, uh, is there no constraint uh, remaining on what can, Japan can do in terms of defense policy? So right now, um, if those are constraints, especially on the activities of a uh, self-defense force and what kind of uh, equipment Japan can acquire, think, things like, and then where self-defense force can operate under what legal authorization and things like that. Um, if you think about those, um, wholesale revision is actually may not be necessary on the right of collective self-defense. Um, as you alluded to, um, Prime Minister Abe's uh, government did the uh, quote unquote limited um, reinterpretation of Article 9 specifically on this issue. And they came out with uh, basically four different, you know, four separate scenarios under which Japan is allowed to exercise the right of collective self-defense. And one of the jump that leap that they took when that was reinterpreted was uh, when the uh, when the uh, country that are friendly to Japan, like United States, uh, came under attack, then um, then Japan can exercise, you know, Japan can exercise that right of collective self-defense. And even though that country name is not specifically mentioned, everybody assumed that it was it was with United States. And uh, situation is more like either another Korean, you know, God forbid, but there's another uh, Korean War number two, or um, Taiwan Strait crisis where um, PRC may try something aggressive vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan and U.S. go counter what you know what Japan cannot stand idly by. However, um, as since that time, there are cases, you know, situations like South China Sea, this time in Ukraine, that, um, that, or, you know, simply, you know, just, we, we only have to think about last year when the uh, Afghanistan fell. There are all these situations that don't quite belong to any of those four categories that uh, Japan is supposed to be allowed to exercise that right. And yet, Japan, there was certainly an expectation that Japan plays some role and the fact that, you know, when it came out that Japan really actually can do very little, really led to a heartburn um, and in a lot of places in the world. So in order for that to happen, I mean, it, one thing only needs to happen is to do away those four categories um, and basically wholeheartedly say Japan can't, exercise right of coll collective defense like NATO countries can. But that is a big leap of faith to take. However, though, I will say this. Um, while um, many here in the United States thought um, Prime Minister Abe would be the one to be able to bring those changes, I always came out on the other side of that. Not because, um, not, I mean, he certainly was a visionary leader that can talk about it. But he himself, because of his own political baggage, whether right or wrong, I'm not making any judgment on that. Um, it made a lot of people uncomfortable when he speaks about it. And as you mentioned, Prime Minister Kishida hails from Hiroshima, nuclear disarmament, even if he's a conservative politician, nuclear disarmament is his lifetime goal. And he's much softer spoken. He, comes out as much more deliberate. Sometimes he came down as like an wishy-washy. I think one of the things that uh, Mr. Kishida has been grossly unrecognized is that 
he put together these uh, current response in Ukraine that are much more firm and much more hardline in, in practice than Prime Minister Abe did back in 2014, 2015. Um, I don't think not enough people either they have not noticed it because of the situation on the ground, or maybe he himself is not a, you know, kind of a type to push himself up front all the time. But I think he he and his effort are kind of un, unrecognized, underappreciated or undervalued. But um, he, a uh, leader like him actually has the right or a pro more um, politically palatable personality to introduce some of those sensitive, sensitive debates. So he's been quietly getting a lot done. I do think so. I always thought uh, if there was any prime minister who can do the Article 9 revision, that would have been Prime Minister Noda because he is from the other political party and LDP, if he said that, they can't say no because that's their goal too. But maybe we have a maybe we have it in Mr. Kishida. I don't know. Jury's out. Well, so um, one issue. Uh, maybe this is our last question. We'll see. Um, maybe we can. I think it would help us if we got a better idea for those of us who aren't experts. So Japan is considering a wide range of issues relating to national security and national defense, including, for example, first strike capability, which wasn't really on the table a few years ago. So how would collective self-defense work in practice? I mean, I think there's two separate scenarios, one in the East China Sea where there's some action against Japanese territory and one in the Taiwan Strait where it's not Japanese territory. But in either event, as a practical matter, what would Japan be expected to do? And wouldn't its, wouldn't its envisioned role have some influence on sort of bolstering their defense capabilities? Has this been discussed in, in any detail? So there are a very distinct difference between the East China Sea scenario, East China Sea slash Senkaku scenario versus Taiwan scenario. Um, or at this day and age, I might even say South China scenario, South China Sea scenario. Um, East China scenario, this is where Japan's own territorial integrity is at stake. So this is not a collective self-defense issue. This is Japan's own national defense issue. However, when it comes to Taiwan, this is the, this is the change in debate that, that we're seeing in Japan right now, that most people had always regarded Taiwan situation as a more of alliance question, more of a collective self-defense question. But in practicality, when some, if something happens in Taiwan, because of its geographic proximity, Taiwan, Taiwan's proximity to Japan. And then also let's not forget, we do host Seventh Fleet um, Marine Three, uh, Three Expeditionary Marine you know, Force is also headquartered in Okinawa, both Japanese territory. Um, it is almost given that some kind of, Japan would get a damage of some kind of a first strike damage vis-a-vis -vis, you know, from PRC. So even if the missile lands in, on the U.S. base in Japan or somewhere out the right outside the base, doesn't matter. As long as the missile falls in territory, that's no longer collective self-defense. It is, it is na Japan's national defense question. And not as many people saw Taiwan's situation that way, but increasingly, I think more and more people um, have begun to see it that way. And then and I think... Um, just the fact that Defense Minister Kishi and other cabinet members have spoken about it quite openly, repeatedly, and there has been very little political repercussion, you know, against those. I think is the testament to that um, flow um, sh um, shift in the uh, debate. South China Sea is a little bit different scenario. Um, it's a little bit farther out. Um, that's where um, Japan recently agreed um, to have a. a reciprocal um, access agreement, or at least to start the negotiation for that with the Philippines. Um, the Philippines will be the first South Asian, Southeast Asian country to have that kind of arrangement with Japan if it does come to fruition. Um, exactly same arrangement exists with Australia. So what happens if something happens? And a lot of people now are only talking about when Japan self-defense force needs to go do uh, disaster relief 
or humanitarian, you know, assistance in that realm. And that allowed that kind of arrangement certainly makes it easier for them to use their base as opposed to, you know, go and make their own base and all that. But what happens in South China Sea? And the Philippine was the direct involvement, you know, had a direct involvement of that. Um, I think, um, I'm sure, you know, deep in the defense, you know, defense circle, those scenario has been played out, but it's not being the, uh, introduced to the uh, more public realm yet. Um, so that one is a little bit of, little bit out on the limb right now, as far as the public discourse goes. Right. On the defense circles, it's certainly within the uh, scope of debate for quite a while now. Okay, well, we've already uh, reached our time limit. It's went by very quickly, um, but we do usually end on time. Uh, much more <laughs> to discuss and, and uh, much more to follow now going forward with your help. And uh, um, we can now uh, follow the debate more carefully, I think, or more knowledgeably in Japan. So we would uh, like to thank our speaker, uh, Yuki Tatsumi, and also uh, Mr. Kenji Murakami uh, for joining us today and also for the audience. Uh, so uh, thank you once again, and I hope you can join us again next week. Goodbye. Thank you.